Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Max Frequency Podcast. I'm your host, Max Roberts, and joining me this time, the executive producer of Last Stand Media, Dustin Furman. Hi, Dustin. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on. I haven't done a guest spot in probably a few months, so I'm excited to get back into it. I had a few people ask me before our, our recent live show. It's like, just please email me in a few weeks. I'll do whatever <laughs> you want. I'll come, I'll wash your car after the live show. I don't care. Just don't just give me a few. So I was happy to just jump in. You asked me. I was like, let's do it. Let's do it this week. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you. I, that was my plan. I knew you had the live show coming up. I was like, I will ask him after the live show. And it actually timed Good pretty move. well. Because back in November, you, myself, and Logan recorded our Resident Evil 4 episode for Chapter Select, the original Resident Evil 4. Mm -hmm. so, and that came out at the beginning of March, right after your live show. So I kind of just used that as the timing of to you know, invite you onto this show. So thank you so much for coming. You are now, I now have two-thirds of the Sacred Symbols crew in the back catalog of Max Frequency. Colin was nice. last year. And I think it was it last year. Yeah, it was last year. It's a time, time means nothing after you have a baby. Oh yeah, it's, it blows your mind. So now I just have to get Chris. Maybe after he fights Froggy Fresh. Right, it's oh, coming up. Gosh. I'm going to that. I'm gonna go. Oh, you're going? Nice. Yeah, I bought. Uh, I heard about it, and the fact that he is fighting Froggy Fresh, who I do know as Krispy Kreme from The Baddest, way back in high school. I was like. That's just too wild to not go see yeah. a person. But no one wanted to go with me, so I'm going by myself. Dang. It'll be fun, though. I was thinking about going, and sure. then I, I lightly talked to Colin about going, and then I, I was kind of waiting to see if someone was going to make the move. So I don't know. I, I, didn't, I have no plans to be there right now, but I wouldn't be opposed to going still. Well, you can make the move, Dustin. And if you do, mm -hmm. I'd be happy to actually meet you in person instead of maybe unknowingly sure. pass each other in packs but yeah i am excited to go <laughs> watch not only him box but the rest of the cards pretty wild man it looks pretty fun oh yeah so i'm excited Definitely. about it speaking of the live event we're going to talk about that but the first thing i had to ask you i want to know what your chipper's order is your go-to oh i was just there last night it's thursday thursday night is the chipper's night <laughs> usually because i'm uh, usually after sacred, I'll, I'll try to quickly start getting started on it. And so then my wife, Holly will get home around, it's like seven, seven thirty, and neither one of us feel like cooking at that point. So mm. it's like, yeah, Chipotle, or as I like to say, of course, chippers it is. So my go-to order is a little more on the basic side, but that's, I don't know. People who listen to sacred know that I'm kind of a basic eater when it comes to food. It's sure. a burrito with white rice. Mm -hmm. and black beans steak half of a scoop of the hot salsa i used to get the full scoop i think they've made it hotter recently so it's mm -hmm. sometimes just overwhelming uh so i do the half scoop cheese and that's it now i have been really into the chipotle rewards recently <laughs> and when you're going there like once a week you actually do get them pretty fast so sometimes i'll do the chips and salsa too okay. uh well, actually not not chips and salsa chips and queso Yes, and yes. so yeah, that's the that's the order right there, kind of okay. basic, like I said, but it's good. Mine's not too far from that burrito, white rice steak, no beans. I get the no fajita beans? veggies, okay. uh, and then uh, yeah, I get the the pico and the corn and cheese, and that's it. And right. sometimes I get chips and queso. Although I feel like their chips are pretty, they skimp on the chips in the bag. There's not a lot of chips they give you. The At least chips down are here. inconsistent. Yeah. You know, sometimes you get too little. Yeah. You need more chips. I've had some chips that were horrible, like really bad. Uh, not very every once, once in a blue moon. I'm like, mm, this was I and I, sh I should say something and be like, hey, these were terrible. And they mm. probably would like right. Not just like, oh, I don't like the way they taste. They're like caked in salt and nasty. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm too nice for that. I am too nice usually for that, too. Sometimes. I'm like, I should complain about this. And then the waiter or waitress comes up and I, I don't complain about it. I don't Yeah. I'm a pushover, I guess, when it comes to eating out. Oh, well. I was I was doing research because like you said, you're like, let's just do it this week. So I had like a day and a half of prep, which is fine. It's plenty of time to uh, to look into people's past and find things mm -hmm. out. And, you know, you're the executive producer now over at Last Stand Media. But back in 2012 and probably a little earlier, as far as I could pin it, 
Uh, you were a part of the Butler Tornado Television, uh, which was voted wow. as the worst morning show, I guess, at high school. <laughs> and uh, you were very proud of it. So, yes. I mean, was that is that kind of where it all started? You clearly have an interest in film, recording things. That That was very evident to me going way back in the Instagram. I mean, way back. I like this level of research. I got to say, I feel like it's like Nardwar. Uh, do you know that guy that like it brings up there's this guy this canadian guy he interviews um like rappers and stuff like that and he'll be like okay. do you remember do you recall what was it when you were working with this guy and it's like some like insane deep cut and they're like how did you know that <laughs> obviously my my uh history with butler tornado television or bttv i think is still some of it's still out there on the internet but okay yeah. i couldn't find that well oh well i can i'll send you a link um okay. but so yeah Dude, BTTV, uh, and particularly my teacher there, were really, really instrumental in the trajectory of my life at the time. In that I was interested in film stuff. I've I've told people before, like I growing up, I messed with Windows Movie Maker and I had like Kingdom Hearts clips. I'd put them to Linkin Park songs and stuff like that. So I already had I did Same? that too. I there's a I, what were they called FMVs or something like I did uh, one, AMV. AMV. Well, I guess that's anime music video, and this was I don't know Kingdom Hearts. Is anyway, anime. I did one for Kingdom Hearts. I think to a band called Red, like a Christian rock. Dude, I like, know. Yeah, I remember that band. Yes, I know. Okay. Wasn't into them, but I went to a lot of festivals that uh, they played at and stuff like that. Yeah, so. there's one of those up there somewhere, like with nice. Sora falling and Riku and you know, oh yeah, I've, yeah. I've yeah done you gotta use thing. that the. <laughs> The like secret ending of Kingdom Hearts, you know, mm. Kingdom Hearts 2, that stuff. All great. So I was really interested in film stuff for a long time. And then in, in high school, it seemed natural that when I started to pick electives, I was getting into media stuff. And I really connected with my teacher there. His name was Mr. Robbins. And he really took me under his wing in a lot of ways and saw a potential in me and really showed me the ropes on a lot of things like basic stuff, but stuff that. I don't know. You wouldn't g generally know like basic camera operation running a live production because we would run the morning show. But I also took all the other classes too, like uh, uh, video one and video two, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He that, that was where I first learned how to use Premiere, uh, which was essential. That's I, the program I still use today. OK, so a lot of the fundamentals uh, were there. And so, yeah, I I. I'm so incredibly thankful for that class and that teacher just because it would I can imagine a different reality where the teacher there didn't care or just was like, and eh, do whatever you want or and and didn't invest time in the students. And then I became disinterested or, or you know, just it, it wouldn't have been the same. So, yeah, shout out. That was where it kind of all began. That's awesome. I'm glad it is, I had a similar experience in high school of. You know, I was in the film class and I had been doing stuff for years because I started making news videos like with Super Smash Brothers Brawl, which I actually just celebrated as we're recording this yesterday. It turned 15. I had a big special episode go up, but nice. by the time people hear it, it was a couple weeks ago. But then, yeah, high school film classes and stuff I learned in Final Cut. That's what she had us use. I remember we were assigned. We were doing the senior DVD and stuff. Oh, yeah. And I was assigned the month of October. And so we were putting in generic statistics that I guess when you would go back and watch, you'd be like, oh, my gosh, this is the top grossing video game of the time or the movie or whatever. The The game I do remember was one of the Call of Duty Black Ops. You know, not surprising. Oh, yeah. But Definitely. for the gas prices, everyone was putting in just like generic footage or pictures of gas stations and then, you know, however much gas was gosh 10 years ago or something i was like no nah, we need to have more fun with this and so i pulled down the zoolander clip of them having a gasoline fight and put mm. that in instead it was way more nice. fun than everyone else so if anyone has their haggerty high school class of 2013 senior dvd if you see zoolander yeah zoolander then that was me you're welcome nice thank you very Paul. nice you know in 2014 on october 11th you met colin moriarty i believe for the first time there's a picture yes. of you and him. He still wears that Dr. Wiley shirt or a version of that shirt, I think. But then, you know, from the Tornado TV to meeting Colin, now you work for and with Colin, Sacred Symbols. I mean, it's quite the journey over the last decade, 
decade or so all the way from there. How's that feel now? Yeah, it is. It's it's crazy to to think back on. And uh, it's something that I I really don't take for granted in that. So I guess some of to, to fill in some of those gaps from from meeting <laughs> Colin and then working. Yeah. I think so. You said that, that was what year? Twenty four. That was. 2014. 2014, at least yeah. according to the, the Instagram posts, I think a Comic Con from yeah, that's, what I could figure out. That's accurate. That was the day after I got married, actually. <laughs> what? <laughs> because <laughs> I got, I was, we got, Holly and I got married, and then we went to New York City for our honeymoon, and we're doing a bunch of random stuff there. And it was during New York Comic Con. Okay. And so that's why Colin was there. And so it was like, well, why not? Why don't we go to this free meet and greet? It was for, it was like a party for IGN sponsored by Legend of Korra when they were doing the game for that. The oh, the game, game. Oh, man, the game's bad, but the show's good. Yeah. Yeah. So it, yeah, it's, it's funny to think back on that. It just, it was like the day after I got married and I was meeting Colin. But so I was working as a, a video editor slash just doing production work at a really small company here in my hometown a lot of uh dance recitals a lot of musical like high school musical stuff filming that doing small commercials like online social media stuff and i had listened to i was getting into podcasts overall because i wanted to pass the time while i was editing something that i didn't need to actively listen to and i guess if that was 2014 it was around ps4 i think yeah, launch because launch for that was 2013 13, right yeah so yeah we're almost at a year of ps4 i think around this time i remember i started listening to beyond around the time i think before ps4 came out or shortly after and so that was a big revelation to me that i real obviously i knew people worked in in gaming coverage and stuff like that i knew of ign obviously i was listening to a show from them but i never considered this idea of people talking about games for a living i thought that was really cool and i was like oh man so i gotta how do i i have production skills how do i eventually figure out how to make it from here to there obviously i gotta work at ign i gotta figure out that or some other site of course and so that's where it kind of began in that i was figuring out like okay how do i start the process and so it's starting my own podcast and then starting a different podcast that was just for gaming and starting to build up some of those skills going to events. My first event was uh, the second PlayStation experience, mm. which was not really in any kind of like official capacity. I just went there uh, with my friend Brandon as normal fans of stuff, but we talked about it on the podcast. So kind of getting a taste for that yeah, and just trying to, work my way up and, and get that skill set, learning how to walk the walk in a lot of ways for this stuff. So after that, uh, I, I did eventually start applying to some of these places and pretty much never hearing anything, which is normal because there's so many people that apply for these oh, things. Yeah. It's nuts. And yeah, it, it's so tough. I did get close one time where I was applying for a job at IGN, that was uh, their lot like a live producer position where I had okay. a phone interview. I had a, a Skype interview at the time. I think it was Skype. Uh, maybe <laughs> yeah, it wasn't Discord for sure. So it, oh, it yeah. would have been it Skype. Would have been Skype. Zoom. Yeah. wasn't big. Yeah, Skype for sure. Right. So I I did the interview and that ended up not working out. Which like in hindsight, I'm I was devastated at the time because I was like, I got so close. The door was like slowly creaking open and then boom, shut again. Like it's never going to happen again. Yeah. So that was disappointing. In hindsight, though, I'm I'm very glad that it, <laughs> it didn't work out because it opened different doors later on. But getting to Colin. So we, you know, we we talked about I, I met Colin at New York Comic Con, but that was totally in a meet and greet fan capacity. Yeah, right. Exactly. So fast forward to a lot of years later, I have a new gaming podcast, and I'm also working on my own gaming site with my friends Brandon and my friend Ben, who is now the associate producer of Last Stand Media. We're working on a site called Handsome Phantom, yeah. and we got accepted to E3, which was awesome. I was like, dude, we we we, we made it, even though like yeah. there was we weren't getting a lot of listeners and there wasn't a ton of traffic to a site, but it was just legitimate enough. 
that the ESA let us in. <laughs> and so Ben, at the time, th this story is really wacky. Every time I tell it, I, I have to think, like, it, this is not uh, normal. <laughs> ben, the, that year or either the year prior, around then, had become the mayor of my hometown. So you some people may campaign. have heard. Right. Yeah. We had, I, I was, I, I always, I, I jokingly gave myself the title of his like campaign manager, not, maybe not his campaign manager, but his like his media manager or something like that. Sure. But it was really me and him and some other people just kind of like knocking on doors and doing stuff like that, like telling people, doing videos, stuff like that. So Ben won. Ben became the mayor, which was cool. That is but cool. This, yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> like, um, I know the mayor. Yeah, like I would the the mayor and I did a a video game podcast together and stuff like that. So it was it was fun. But at that time Colin was doing a show called Fireside Chats where he interviewed just overall interesting people, interesting scenarios, stuff like that. So Ben offered to him, he said, "Hey, I'm the mayor of a small town. I know that's the type of thing that might interest you. Let me know if you're interested." Colin said, "Yes." So at E3 I basically went along with Ben to go to Colin's house for the recording. Colin was nice and was like, yeah, if you have someone with you, that's fine. Which it was just Ben and I 3 So it was like either I go with him or I go and find a coffee shop for three hours and do nothing. So, yeah. How many so, E3s have you been to? This is my first E3. I've been to a lot of other conferences and conventions. Okay. Um, but this is my first show. And, and you're joined by your friend Dustin. Now, you... Uh, Dustin, you're not mic'd, but is this your? Oh, you can just nod, yes or no. Is this also your first E3? This is how many E3s have you been to? Second, Second E3. Okay. Um, I am so thrilled that I have to go to the show this year. That's the first time I met Colin in a more official capacity, mm -hmm. and he actually remembered me that day, which was crazy. He's like, I don't know where I've met you before, but I have. And Dustin, I I know you from somewhere, right? We've met. We've met. Okay. I. I I feel like I'm like, I know you from somewhere. <laughs> I, I know you from somewhere. Which is, now it's funny because when I meet people at events and stuff, I can almost always recognize the same face again, but I never know where, like, from where I'm like, I, I know that I've we've talked before. I've seen you before. Yeah. It was then, I think just a few months after E3, that on one of the shows, Colin mentioned that he was looking for an editor, but he was looking for someone local, and... That he wanted someone he could that could start editing podcasts and stuff like that, and Ben was the one who told me like, dude, you should you should shoot your shot, give it a you know, send him an email, even if he doesn't want someone local. Uh, files can be uploaded. You just give it a shot. Okay, cool. I'll I'll give it a shot. And so what was funny about this is that I had listened to Colin for so many years that I knew how to craft my email that would. Not uh, manipulate is the wrong word, but appeal specifically to his interests in that I tried to keep it brief and to the point mm -hmm. and just say, hey, this is who I am. This is how we met. I heard you wanted this. Here's my portfolio. Let me know. And so, yeah, the Colin then was like, OK, I was looking for someone local, but I'll give you a shot. And so it started where I edited a few episodes of Knockback. I think my first episode was maybe... Metal Gear Solid knockback where I did the editing and it was all secretive at the time because sure. he wanted to test and see if I could edit it the same way he does. And so the audience wouldn't know. And so I was able to pass, which was cool. So it started with just knockback and then I was editing fireside chats and over the months it kind of built up and I was making a pretty nice chunk of change, like editing these shows on the side. And this is while I was doing my other job. It wasn't enough that I could leave my other job, but I was happy to just be doing something and something that I worked on for very long to just be like, okay, I'm I'm doing some grunt work, but that's okay. I'm I'm cool hustle. with that. Yeah, exactly. I obviously like I wanted to move up and and do other stuff within the company, but I knew that I kind of just needed to to prove myself for a while. So, yeah, eventually the the big deal of course was when Colin offered like, "Hey, I want you to edit Sacred Symbols." And he made it clear, like, this is a big deal. Like, you can't screw this up. This is the the big show. This is the thing that people come here for now. This has to be good. So, yeah, I got to start editing Sacred Symbols, which was cool, too. So I was editing all the shows at that point. And from there, it was just kind of a steady evolution where 
I was really hoping at that point, I really wanted to call and be like, hey, why don't we work something out that you just come work for me and I'll do other, add other stuff. And that can be your job. I was kind of just waiting. I didn't want to ask for it, but I was just like, if I just continue to, to do what I'm doing, maybe that will happen. And then it was... Uh, in March of tw- around March of 2020, early 2020 was when Colin was like, "Okay, let's just let's just bring you on, um, and I'll I'll make you a producer, and you can do some other tasks for me, some some video editing stuff like that." That's early and COVID 2020, right? right before COVID, right before yeah, well, March, because PAX was right. around. Okay, so like COVID was a thing in China, but it hadn't blown up in the states yet. Right. Exactly. Gotcha. Yeah, COVID hadn't really started yet. And the reason I can remember it so specifically was I was trying to work out where I was now basically full time for Last Stand, but I was still doing some hours at my old job. And I was trying to make it work out just to to make a little extra cash where I was kind of like flipping flipping the scales a bit. And then it eventually just wasn't working uh, like it, it, it was it was a little bit too much at the same time and so my last day at my old job was uh right the day i left the day before i left for pax in 2020 Mm -hmm. and it's so ironic thinking back to it now because i remember leaving my job like dude i get to work from home now this will be so cool (laughs) and then promptly (laughs) pax happened and then covid and then everyone was working from home which was you know fine i still it didn't diminish the fact but it was just ironic everyone started working from home at the same time yeah so yeah, I, th- that's the the long, long winded history of those two points connecting. And obviously, and then Sacred Symbols gets involved with me being on that show, too. But yeah. oh, I've talked long enough now. No, I, it's fascinating. I hear a lot of similar points to my own journey or trying to break into the industry. It was I was working at a Kmart and was getting back into podcast. I'd listened to Show Me Your News for Super Smash Brothers Brawl. When I was like 13 or so, I guess that would have been around 2007, 2008. But then I kind of dropped away from podcasts listening to them. I had one with some friends there for a little bit. But our princess is in another castle, or as we just shortened it to be called Bopiak. It was a terrible name. Terrible, terrible name. But we did that for a little bit, and then I fell away. But then I was stocking things at Kmart, and I was like, I got to have something to listen to while I'm doing all this. And so I turned back to podcasts, and that's where I discovered Beyond. Uh, listening to Greg and Colin, that would have been around the time I was really getting. I had always been interested in the PlayStation, and you know, other kids had PS2s, but I was always a Nintendo kid, and I didn't have anything really. And so I was interested. And 2013, I would get no, 2011. That's Uncharted Three. 2011 Christmas is when I got a PS3, the Uncharted Three bundle. So oh, probably, nice. Probably the best Christmas, like de facto ever because it was uncharted and then i spent i borrowed uncharted one from a buddy on christmas day and then the next day because we were busy on christmas itself i sat in my room on a crt i wasn't even playing on an hd tv and i played all of uncharted one in one sitting that was like the day it was a great great day um and then i would go buy two and then obviously finally play three and had a blast three three was the best of that original trilogy. But anyway, uh, beyond, I'd be listening to it and it dawned on me one day putting towels and soap away in like the bathroom stock room. I was like, they're getting paid to talk about and write about video games. I'm like, I want to do that. And so that turned into me trying to work at IGN, not in the production side of things, which honestly would have been the smarter route but I thought being a journalist was the best way to do that. So I went to school for journalism. That is useless to do a degree useless nowadays because mostly it's video and being a host and things like that. I mean, people still write news stories and it's quite valuable. But, you know, IGN is not what it used to be anyway. Most sites right. aren't. It's just changed. It's just change of guard. It's the same thing. It was happening when we were listening to Bayon back in the day, you know, those um wasn't it dunham and stuff they were all leaving and greg and colin were like the new guard and then people came in under them and it happens all the time and so we were listening to that those shows i was like i'll do this i'll be a journalist and then i got 
married after college and was like, California is too expensive. But in that time, I worked for IGN as a freelance guide writer. And I was like, this is my way in. I'm writing guides, working away. And I would go on to do stuff. Uh, listeners who've been around for a bit, you know, I may have heard I've done like God of War and Red Dead Redemption 2. So I got to end up working on some of the biggest games, honestly, of the last generation. And that was super fun, super hard work, grunt work, kind of like editing podcasts for other things. And eventually that just turned into doing my own things. And, and now I'm quite content uh, doing this stuff now. And I've, I would love to do this sort of stuff professionally in some capacity. But in the meantime, I'm doing it for myself. And that is, I think, the right space to be at, especially after I was kind of working myself to a nub uh, yeah, a few years definitely. ago. Hit a refresh, and now I feel really good where we're at. So it's interesting the similarities there, all just chipping away at getting in. But it is it is about the grind and a little bit of grunt work and just putting in the paces. And eventually you get up to producing the bigger things and editing. But always you gotta you gotta wanna do it. Don't do it because other people tell you you should, or if you're not enjoying it, you shouldn't be doing it, I think is you get you oh, gotta yeah. wanna do it first, for sure. The thing that I always that I mean, Colin and I talk about this for for both of us is that and and most people in this industry is that it is it's not to undermine your own skill or talent or whatever like that, but it is so based around luck. Oh, yeah. Um, Like you have to it is about being in the right place at the right time, meeting the right people, you know, saying the right thing. It's it's really uh, like stressful thinking about it now. It's just like. Uh, the, the key that I always say is that it is about luck, but you've got to be like locked and loaded that when you do get the shot that you're, you're ready to go and you have to be able to roll the dice as many times as possible. And it can be so crushing to roll the dice again and again Again. and again, and then nothing happens. And it's like, you just, sometimes it can happen. Sometimes it can't, sometimes it takes way long and some people get in real fast. It just is again, it's, it's all about luck. But it's it's having the work to back up. You you like you got to put in the work, and then also have the luck over here. You can't just. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess you could have just the luck, but if you don't have the work, uh, I mean, you won't last long if you get the job. I've seen it happen. You know, like people that get in, like Philip Musing comes to mind. You remember him? Mm, IGN's a Nintendo yeah. guy. I was actually in San Francisco. That was the first time I was out. First and only time I've been out in San Francisco, and I met up with the guides team and stuff and got to meet the people I'd been working with for years. And they did a little Q&A. It was the day of an IGN meet and greet or whatever. And Philip was there. And I remember asking him, you know, what's it like to follow in the footsteps of of Rich George and Jose Otero, big Nintendo IGN guys beforehand? And I honestly don't remember his answer. But looking back now, it's like, oh, gosh, that pressure crushed him to a degree. And I remember Mm -hmm. listening to the interview on Sacred. And I honestly don't know what he's doing now. I haven't really followed up but that was that was a huge scandal and for it to come from ign was also a really really big deal at the time but if you don't have the work to like go along with the luck like you said you won't last you won't last long at all but to get a little bit more technical because i enjoy talking about this stuff i wanted to know about the home setup the process of how you record and edit your role now you do you edit the video version of Sacred? Is that right? You you yes. don't do the the audio version, right? That's Ben, no. correct? Mm-hmm. Okay. That's correct. So I'm just curious what what the whole setup is, what you use, what software you use, how it, how your process works. Sure. So uh, let me think where to start here. Okay. Well, I guess we all use the same basic setup overall we use these sure i think it's this is the sm7b right yeah, that's and then, a very popular one yeah it's it's overkill uh for it's most everywhere. people i know like a lot of people when they get into this they're like oh i need to get that mic it's mm-hmm. like no you don't uh you can get something much cheaper the point <laughs> I, of this mic is to take out like guesswork for if you're doing this on a, a mass scale where you it's like you don't want to think about positioning and stuff like that this mic makes that easy uh Mm -hmm. but so you don't need this you know expensive mic if you i mean if you got the cash burn do whatever you want but uh so we have we all have this mic and they're all run into these zoom p4 which you and i were talking about a little bit before the show starts Mm -hmm. 
And the reason why we use this device in particular is it has the ability to record to an SD card and to be connected to your computer at the same time. So this is important for, uh, I mean, maybe more than one, but the one <laughs> main reason for me is that there are multiple backups of every podcast we record. Yes. So we record locally. Everyone records locally, which in addition, when I'm recording locally, I'm also recording any sounds my computer hears. So that's like the last case backup is the, you know, the, the call mic or whatever is, is coming in. But on the computer itself, we use an app called Zencaster, which is actually like it's a web app. So you just go to the website Zencaster.com. And through that, you're able to it's kind of like a Discord call, but it's more focused around doing video podcasts. So it records everyone's audio and video locally on their computer and it uploads as you record. And then once that's done, we can edit those files. You get individual video files for each person that are 1080p. I think it even has 4K support. We don't use that just because we don't we don't quite need that level. But mm. Zencaster is overall a really great tool. They're not the only people in the business doing stuff like that. We used to use Riverside, which is also a really popular one that has actually more features than Zencaster. It's just we found it to be not quite as reliable. So that's why we switched over to, to Zencaster. But that's a, another backup there. So everyone has their own audio files. We've got the Zencaster audio files. Everyone technically has each other's, a version of each other's audio mm -hmm. files. So in the history, I'm pretty sure I can say that in the history since I've taken over, uh, all of the production aspect. I don't believe we have ever lost an episode ever. There's always been some kind of backup or something we can use. We have had spots where the video has cut in and out because we've had problems with Zencaster, but there's always been audio, which is great. And that's so important at our, when we're doing like five, six shows a week, you, you can't be spending time like thinking like, is this going to work? It has to be reliable. And that's some, a part of this setup that when I was designing is like, we cannot lose shows. We have to make sure it's reliable. And that's, it's hard when you have a weakest link, like sometimes Zencaster or Riverside, every once in a while, you'll run into issues with those as well. Sure. But that's all part of the process is being able to adapt and problem solving. In fact, I feel like literally a third of any production person's job is going to be problem solving, figuring oh, out yeah. what's not working, why it isn't working, how to fix it, how to help other people fix their issues. It's a big, big part of the process. So that's all the recording process. And then as far as editing, I mentioned earlier, we use Adobe Premiere, which I found now is in a much better spot than it was just a few years ago. It was really buggy a few years ago. I was trying to switch over to Final Cut, but... Final Cut wasn't quite fitting what I needed as far as like a multicam show situation. Interesting. I actually, what was weird, I mean, to get real nitty gritty, uh, what the on. problem I was having with Final Cut is that it didn't really like the files from Zencaster and mm. the render times, even on my brand new M1 Max MacBook, were bad. Really? But the, 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 and I couldn't figure it out. I was trying all kinds of stuff and I'm like, this Final Cut does not. There's some kind of codec or something in these files that it does not like. What's the so, file Zencaster spitting out? I can't imagine it's funky. I think there's some codec within it or something, because I think they're MOVs or MP4s. Um, huh. I can actually check. I have I so I'm right now I'm recording. I have a, a two a dual setup where I have a MacBook and I have my PC right next to each other. Okay. And I also have like three I have two keyboards, I have three <laughs> mice, like it's it's all over the place here. Uh yeah, they're just they're QuickTime files. But I wonder if it's H.264 or 265. Uh let me that, see. That, that, I think that. they're 264. Huh. I'm cuz I do, I use Final Cut. That's I've I mean I've used Premiere in college specifically that's what they had to use in our journalism stuff, but I'm a Final Cut boy born and raised and well, you're now living in a good a good era of Final Cut. Yes, this uh, is true. Well, when we were coming up at the same time, in that 
when Final Cut 10 launched, it was a disaster. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I remember I had an internship at a place in Pittsburgh, like a really legit um, production house that did like cool like commercials and stuff like that, documentaries. And they were still on Final Cut 7 for mm -hmm. years after that because no one wanted to use Final Cut 10. They were either using Final Cut 7 or they were using Premiere. Yeah. So I like kind of begrudgingly use Premiere. Like I said, it's in a very – it's it's better than ever right now. It, well, I, I can't say better than ever, but it's better than it's been for a while because there was a time <laughs> probably like four or five years ago where the stability of the software was so bad. I also think that part of the reason why I'm having a better time with it is that I am – when I do my production work, it's on a Mac and not a PC. Yeah. I've always found that – I love PCs. I have an awesome gaming PC. I used to do all my production work on a PC, but then I switched back to, to Mac when I could afford it. Again. Back to the Mac. I, I came back to, well, and the, I mean, Mac, Apple kind of dropped the ball on professionals for a long time too. It was a dark, it was a dark time. Yeah, it was a dark time. So I'm happy to be back on Apple stuff and I'm finding it's just so much better now for that yep. stuff. But yeah, we edit in Premiere Pro. And that's uh, Ben also edits the audio in Premiere Pro, which I know is not traditional because here's why is that we tried using other programs like Audition. And I think we also tried to use Logic at one point. But okay. because the frequency of the cuts, there's so many cuts in every episode that we found overall that we just were having an easier time using Premiere. Okay. Like, basically, I, I'm pretty sure Ben's process now, because he's changed things since I've done it, is that he, like, runs the all the files through some filters and stuff like that, and then he brings them into Premiere to do all the chopping and editing. And overall, we found that that's just the better tool set for what we need. Yeah. I, I'm sure it's possible that if we knew more about those other programs, maybe we'd find it to be more efficient. But, yeah, all of our audio is, is edited in premiere as far as the the cuts and stuff so that's that's fascinating i have a buddy peter spasia he does everything in premiere as well and he just cites it as he's more familiar with it kind of sounds like what you guys well, yeah familiar that's part with of the case for us that. too yeah mm -hmm. i i use logic i learned how like i got the that apple education bundle because when i got my mac for graduating college or whatever because i wanted final cut and i'm like well if i'm getting logic with it Let's learn how to use Logic. And I've come yeah. to a really good space with it because it's got this great strip silence tool, which I think Audition now has something comparable. I've never honestly liked the look of Audition. Like, that's my biggest deterrent is I just don't like looking at Audition. I think yeah. Logic's very pretty, and I guess that's an, an Apple touch to it. But you know, I just strip silence, line everything up beforehand, and then I'm pulling and tweaking as I go. And that's the that's my routine with it um is using logic and then i export that and as a wave file and then mix it down with other stuff and now yeah. i have a pre-production process with different apps to like i actually i use audition to match the loudness because i like the match mm. loudness tool in audition so that you and i or whoever's on the show sound the same it doesn't get too crazy right. and i use some other stuff in there but it's, I'm always interested in people's processes, how shows are put together. For for the audio and video versions, this is my biggest yeah. deterrent from doing a video version of any of my shows right now with faces, is because I do such a detailed cut of the audio. I'm stripping, you know, ums, too long of a pause, you know, cleaning it up the way a really good podcast, I think, should be done. But if you if you take that audio and you do that to the video... Then you're jumping around people's mouth. You know, it's just so they're two separate edits, aren't they? Yeah. Well, that's the thing. What we tell people often is that the the most produced, cleanest version of, of Sacred Symbols is the audio. And that we put the most amount of time goes into the audio version since yeah. it's a three to four hour show that is finely edited by someone who goes through and meticulously removes any weird sounds or uh, like you were saying, ums, ahs, pauses or whatever. So really the, 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 like I said, the, the cleanest overall experience is going to be the audio version of sacred. But like you said, you can't do that to the video version. At least 
I guess in theory you could figure out a way to do it, but you would have you would be spending hours and hours trying to like switch between cameras to try to like cover or like you'd have to figure out a way with B roll and stuff like that to cover it up. It would be it, at be our pace literally impossible for for Last Stand. So our video versions are much much more raw. It doesn't mean that we don't ever cut stuff. Sometimes someone will one of us will flub something so bad that we'll have to cut it and then just we'll just there'll be a few hard cuts per episode or, or someone needs to pee or something like that. Something sure. happens every once in a while. We will have cuts in the video version, but yeah, it's, it's a more raw version of the show. And that's just kind of how it is by the nature of, of what it is. People really enjoy the video version. In fact, since we launched the video version, it's kind of cannibalized our audio a little bit, not a lot, but yeah. we've definitely seen a shift and that's okay with us, but just because people like to consume the show in different ways. Some people sure. like to see it. I do think that there are elements of the video that are, are really good. In fact, this, this episode we just released t- today at the time of recording, there's something that is probably the most outrageous amount of laughter in Sacred Symbols that has ever happened that you really have to watch the video version. And I, yeah. I like I encourage people sometimes like, dude, you even if you listen to the audio version, just go find this part in the video and just watch that so you can see it. Just cause it does add a, a different element to it for sure. Yeah, they're different. That seems to be Sacred Symbols episode two forty five, delayed yes. execution, which I yeah, looks like it's about Suicide Squad, which good God, that game. Uh mm-hmm. what a mm-hmm. disaster. It's seems to be on all fronts which is really sucky for rocksteady but oh yeah i digress um you should check that out there will be a link to that in the show notes by the time this is up that should be up for everybody so you should everyone can go check that out that's kind of my that's my big deterrent though is i could do a video version or an audio version but i want the audio version to be th- that best one which means i'd have to edit it twice and i personally don't have the bandwidth to do those types of things so oh, that's yeah. just like Oh, well. So I just upload audio to YouTube and people can theoretically just listen there. At least it's somewhere for someone to listen to. So I want to take this production angle at home. Everything's cozy. Everything's set up. Now we're going to take you to Texas or any live show, really, that you guys Mm. do. But Texas, most recent Houston, Texas, you guys did uh, Sacred Symbols Live number two, even though I think it's the third. Uh, Evening with Last Stand 2. Evening with Last Stand 2. That is what... You guys call it the most overrated video games of all time was the topic of the night. First of all, I heard in the beginning of the of Sacred Symbols, I guess, 244. Sounds like it went really well. You guys were next to Moulin Rouge, I think, was the show yes. next door. But just before we get into the nitty gritty of producing a live show, which has to be wildly different. Just how was it? How was the trip to Houston and the show there? Oh, it was awesome. It was Good. super fantastic. We had a great time in Houston. A lot of friendly people in Houston. It's kind of some of that Southern hospitality for sure. And yeah, it was awesome. Me and and Ben and uh, our wives and even my parents were down there. We stayed an extra day so we could just go around and, and enjoy the city a little bit. And it was a it was an awesome time. I love doing live shows. It is the it is a huge way for us to like get re-energized about what we're doing, just having a totally different energy in the room and being able to meet people and stuff like that. So I, I, I love doing them. I, I want to do more of them. They're just they're They can be difficult to pull off. Yeah. I think besides just the coordination of booking a venue, traveling to said venue, planning like the topic layout of the show, it sounds like you guys have a whole presentation at least these mm-hmm. evenings with last stands seem to be themed around a topic and then you all present almost like a, a keynote or a PowerPoint. It, right. Correct. Okay. I haven't seen, I have not been to one of the shows. It's coming. Okay, good. The video is coming. You will be able to see it is what I should say. Yes. Uh, that's very good to hear. Very exciting. But what is that? What is the process like of actually prepping for a live show, getting it set up, making sure everyone sounds good, looks good? looks good cam is someone i'm i want to know the whole process is are you hiring sure. another company to film it are you filming it what's the what is the 
Last Stand Media live show process. So let me be crystal clear about something right off the bat is that the person who puts the most work pretty much all, I don't want to say all the work because obviously there we need to show up and we need to do the show. But as sure. far as the production aspects, that is Ben. OK, Ben is the ma- the the event mastermind. Not that I don't have other stuff to say, but I'd recommend mm-hmm. if you ever want to have him on the show. I know him. I can, <laughs> I can okay. hook you up. But it, he's he's really the mastermind of the events. That's actually like the other half of his job as far as like he does a a lot of our audio editing and he's Mm -hmm. obviously the associate producer but um one of his his main initiatives is being the guy behind the event so not that i don't have any input and stuff because we a lot of times bounce ideas around each other off of each other and stuff like that but planning events what i will say is just that there's so much that goes into it behind the scenes. And I think that's obvious to people who understand at least some level of production, but even just figuring out where to go can be tough. We were looking at, we thought we were going to go to Vegas next was, was what we really wanted to do until we found out that we simply for the type of venue we wanted, we couldn't afford it. It was just really, really expensive to do that. And so we thought, we wanted to go somewhere further west. We weren't quite sure about doing California yet. So we thought, why don't we check out Texas? And so then it's like, okay, well, which city in Texas? Let's look at the different venues, figure out how much they cost. And then figuring out, you know, because we have a very, we're in a weird spot where, you know, a touring, a touring bands can go around. They can fill 400, 500 room place, multiple cities a week, right? Sure. Where Obviously, we have an amazing level of su- support from our audience that we love, but it is we are still like a a niche community in, on the internet. So we have to make sure it's like okay, we want a place that we don't want it to be too big, so and not like end up like performing for an not an empty place, but we don't want it to be weird. We want to make sure that it's like the right amount, the right level of cozy. And so this event, this venue, I think was like five hundred people yeah. or so 500 seats or something like that which sold, we sold out i think pr- close it's a weird we were pretty close to okay. selling out and i think that it, we appreciate this from our audience but some people are very gung-ho about getting tickets and then a lot of people buy tickets and then figure out later they can't go mm. or something like that so it wasn't like every seat was full but it was definitely full which was great that's Good. and that's that's what exactly you full Right, exactly. And so and that include the floor and the, the balcony and stuff like that. So it was it was awesome. But yeah, uh, there's, you know, that level too is just figuring out, okay, well, where are we going to go? So we, you eventually figure out a venue and then someone needs to be like back and forth about all kinds of stuff with the venue, like how many people are going to be there? How are we going to sell tickets? Merch. Uh, merch is actually probably where a lot of my efforts go okay. into this event, like figuring out coordinating with Micah. Okay, how are we going to get the merch there who's going to sell the merch uh unfortunately with live events we have to charge a little more for our merch because the venue takes some of it which oh really it, it, yeah it ends up being a net like okay for our audience because they don't have to pay shipping but mm. oftentimes you do have to pay a percentage uh, and stuff like that and so there's a lot of and dude and then it goes beyond that like ben has to go and book everyone's flight there Ben has to figure out which hotel we're staying at. And that's from uh, like three or four different cities, you know, so Collins yeah. and, and the Richmond area. Uh, I honestly don't know where Chris is now. I don't remember if he's East Coast or West he's Coast. In LA. Okay, he's in, yeah, LA, he's in now. LA now. He's moved mm-hmm. a lot recently, I feel oh, like. Oh, yeah. He it's, has. That's probably a wild story in and of itself, just the frequency yeah. of cross country. I don't even know a lot of it. It's but anyway, LA. So LA, Virginia, Pennsylvania, New York all over the place so that's and it's not like you're all booking the same airline you you want it to be affordable you know you guys can't just be spending i don't know what the super premium airline would be but you know it's got to make sense for everybody and not a bunch of layovers these days and right fear of flight cancellations yeah well that's the thing is that we all we came out on on Thursday just to make sure that we were all there. Chris ended up coming in the next day, but that was a whole different situation. But yeah, there's there's a lot of of planning. And like like you said, Ben and I are very 
uh, thrifty. Not that we're making people fly like the worst seat ever or book in like some horrible motel, but we're also just trying to figure out. It's like, okay, we want to – events are very expensive, and yeah. it's one of those things that we want to do it for our audience. We like doing it for the audience, and it's not that we're making zero money. But we are – we don't make as much as I think people would think just because yeah. there's a, a lot of uh, expenses that go into these things. And it's one of those things – again, we're, we're happy to do it uh, because we like it. We love it. And we know the audience loves it too. So I would – you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think while it may not be all monetary profit, there's a – a community connection there, not only between you and the audience, but the audience getting together that, like you said, re-energizes both you and the community. It builds a bond. And so there's a value with the audience there, which yes. you can't necessarily measure that as monetary. I mean, you know, maybe some of these folks up their patron or they tell other people about the show or they go, we were here and did this. And so there's that word of mouth, but it's it's the tight knitness tight knitness the the connection of the community we'll say it's worth (laughs) yeah yeah just building up the community so you gain kind of a a value that you can't necessarily put a dollar amount on and that strengthens it and then comes back in through other means i would think right yeah oh absolutely and that's like when our first event that we actually did in my hometown here in butler we did our event on a friday or no it was on a saturday night and then the next day we we booked a park shelter here yes. in Butler. I remember and about we that. just Yeah, and we met people for 6 hours. Just anyone who was there, it's like we're hanging out. We're we're yep. we're just meeting people. Uh and it and it was funny cuz I in my mind, like we had a food truck there and and some stuff. In my mind, it was going to be like us hanging out, just kind of just around, but then it was like no, this is not going to work. We need to we set up the tables and then like there was a lot literally 6 hours long. And here's the thing, we were pumped and happy to do that. It was very tiring and exhausting, but the thing is people the the people that come to these things and the people that enjoy our content are so incredibly generous that they are I mean we obviously we have awesome perks at our Patreon. We want to give the most value, but theoretically a lot of our stuff you can get for free. Oh yeah. I'm honestly surprised at how much you do give away. Yeah. Like your spoiler yeah. cast and things. Like I get the idea of like God of War Ragnarok. People want to hear, and so you just delay that release. I I get that, but mm-hmm. I am genuinely surprised at how much Sacred Symbols Plus and other exclusive stuff you guys put out, which is awesome as a consumer. Right. So in our mind, it, it, it's it's like this is like the least we can do is mm. try to give people an, an opportunity to to see us and and, uh, and meet with us unfortunately with some of our with our events that haven't been the butler event which we we would eventually like to do butler again and do kind of like an open meet and greet is that it's just simply it's not feasible to meet everyone at every event yeah like and that's why we've We've really tried, like the last two events, we've done VIP sessions, which they do cost more money because we do have to make them limited. Because as I said, we can't, it's not possible to meet everyone at every event. But we really try to make at least the VIP session that if you are paying the extra money, you are getting a valuable extra from it. It's not just uh, like this, this recent show, our VIP session, I thought was really awesome. You got, I think it was either half hour or 45 minutes of we were just in an upstairs room, kind of more cozy, no microphones. And it was just 45 minutes of like an, an unfiltered podcast where people asked us questions. We talked about stuff. And then the second half was everyone got a photo with the crew and everyone got a poster included. So okay. it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a balance of figuring, figuring that out. But back to your original point is just that, the the overall value it really is hard to you can't put a dollar on it about that that aspect of community building and and building up to something exciting and stuff like that so it always is figuring out that balance and and stuff like that but we're happy to do it i love doing events i hope we never not that there's any reason we would stop but like right. it is a clear initiative for us that we love doing yeah it's great so the video version of like Houston or something. Are you editing mm-hmm. that or do you guys hire another company to yeah. film and edit that stuff? So 
for this event, which I'm I'm able to tell you whatever you want because we just uh, talked about all this information on Sacred Symbols that came out today. Okay. Cool. Uh, we hire a company to do that. They're called Catalog Company. They are awesome. I think they're based in New Jersey. They filmed Sacred 200 for us. So they shot it in like immaculate 4K quality, cinema grade cameras. Yeah. And what's awesome is that these guys are fans of the show, which we mm. we love doing that because working with fans uh, in the right context can be really awesome because, you know, there's like that. They understand our care to quality and there's like an extra emphasis. And obviously we, we like to support our fans in ways that we can. So working with them has been great. They did such an excellent job with Sacred 200 and they were able to come out to Texas to film this event as well, which was great that we were able to work. We, I wasn't sure we were able to do that financially, but it, it worked out still. The thing is like these guys, the quality is super high. It's, it's not like hiring your, your local videographer with, with a few cameras it's definitely a lot more expensive to the than that but it's yeah. it's worth it their, their quality is insane and so with that they they hand the footage off to me and i'm editing it currently okay so i'm actually i'm pretty close to being done with it but i'm so excited it looks so good like i said this one also shot in 4k it'll be in 4k on youtube and yeah we're initially releasing that only to our five dollar patrons for a pretty long time actually yeah. that it's going to be exclusive on patreon just because like i said it is one of the biggest expenses of the event is to have it filmed but Yo, we understand the importance of it as well so yeah i'm editing it right now and it looks great i don't know is there any other am i missing any other aspects you want to know about for that i guess is the audio sep the audio would be separate is there an audio? Do you do audio versions of the show? Do you ever upload that as into a podcast into the, I guess, the patron podcast feed and just pe let people listen to the live event? So for the first live event, I don't think we did an audio version, even though people asked us to do it. Yeah. Because it, like you said, these are presentations. We're presenting the greatest game of all time. We're presenting what we think is the most overrated game. And so there's a key visual aspect. The show is designed for a live audience. Really. It's designed for the people in that room first and foremost. Okay. And then it's being adapted to being a YouTube video. And it just isn't going to work as audio. Now for sacred 200, that was a little different because it was a numbered episode of the show. So it was essential for us to have an audio version, mm -hmm. but Going forward, I believe that we're going to be doing these as like it's it's a video. So there will be no audio for this version or for this show. It wouldn't make sense. There's key jokes and different stuff that it, it must be seen. But that's the thing. We're doing it in the best possible quality. You're going to want to see it yeah. in 4K if you can or even whatever. Whatever TV you have, it's going to look great. You want to look at it. I got gotcha. you. Mm -hmm. it's, it's always an interesting balance between a visual medium and the and using audio as the medium too especially when your primary product is shows and podcast so it's interesting right. to just figure out that balance because it is a visual because the live event is for people actually there so it's not like they would just sit i mean people probably would just sit there and watch the floor of you like on a couch talk but you guys do a whole you kind of uh amp it up's not the right i guess you do amp it up but like there's a a flair to it it's a show right the key for us the performance right yeah the key for me always is in a, and i'm i don't know this is in no way a diss at all but when we did our live event i wanted to make it clear to people it's like we're not this isn't like kind of funny live i think it's cool the level of production and the amount of stuff they put into their show that's not what we're trying to go for and i'm not saying our way is better or their way is better but I want it to be some level of like, yeah, this is a speaking event or whatever, where you're getting a taste of what we do, but we do have some extra fun stuff, you know, spiced in there. Uh, there's a, there's a few fun things in this recent show okay. that I'm excited for people to see that I know I'm, I'm, maybe some people have seen it. Maybe some people have spilled the beans a bit, but we had a, a little fun intro okay. that I think people will like. All right. People should keep an eye out for that. I, an analogy came to mind. You tell me if this is right or not. 
Uh, you you brought up kind of funny live, and their productions are through the roof. It's insanity seeing the stuff that they do. So would you maybe? My brain immediately went to a, a stand up comedian, where you guys maybe more stand up comedian who's on stage intimate show, telling a story, doing a performance, compared to Weird Al, who's also a funny person. <laughs> But he's obviously a musician. It's a concert more, but he's there's jokes and stuff in his songs. So that's at least the analogy I came to. And that's a whole production. Right. So and that would be maybe kind of funny. And I love Weird Al. So, yeah, C- Colin compared it. Colin was the one who wanted to call it an evening with Last Stand because he wanted to have a vibe of, like you said, like a comedian, like an evening with Jerry Seinfeld. I think was his <laughs> example is that this is a you're coming for this type of speaking yeah. engagement or whatever. I'm the one who's always pushing for more uh you know theatrics and and production stuff which for the like sacred 200 the the gamer battalion anthem was something that ben and i added that was like a little over the top and i like doing a little bit of that uh i think that that definitely has a place but yeah it's just different different ways of of handling things i it would be stupid of me not to ask some a host of sacred symbols about psvr2 while i had them on my show so i know it showed up actually right before you left for texas you didn't even touch Mm -hmm. it till you came back i just listened to your guys's impressions and colin's sweet spot blurriness issues and you know your impressions of resident evil and stuff so i wanted to touch base with you a few weeks of psvr2 you may have talked about it on the new episode of sacred symbols i'm not sure but I also have the headset. I've been playing it where I can. It's kind of hard to play with a five-month-old <laughs> around. So that's a bit tricky. But what what are we at? Three weeks post-launch? What's We've kind of eased into this initial launch lineup. How are you feeling about it? Dude, the more I play it, the more I love it. Truly. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm really... I think I'm at, at this point this weekend, I'm going to probably end up buying one or two new games just because I've I've really cleared some space now in my gaming time just for VR because I I'm all done with Ho- I finished Hogwarts Legacy just a, two nights ago now and that was kind of hanging over me but now I I'm, and I've already played I've played a bunch of of these games but I'm really ready to to focus in but I'm loving it and I'm I'm shocked at the overall improvement when I really stop to think about it. I think that some of the, not to say people's criticism isn't valid, but I think that we're forgetting what we're coming from as far as the, the first PSVR. This thing is such a huge upgrade in so many ways. And the, the main games that they have for it at launch are really quite awesome. Now, mm-hmm. on the other side, though, I think that there is definitely some concern about the future of this device and what games are coming. Because we're kind of in the dark right now as far as like what kind of obviously we we know about lots of indies and smaller titles. And those are great. I love those. But at the same time, we want to see full support from some from Sony on this thing. Yep. And right now, I don't know what that looks like. But the games that we do have... uh Resident Evil 8 is so scary. I don't know how I'm going to get through that game, but I'm, <laughs> I'm enjoying it every time I play it. GT7 is amazing. I actually, I have a wheel. Like, I figured out this site. I knew that I wasn't willing to invest the $400 into a basic wheel, because I know this is a passing obsession, but I found this <laughs> website that lets you rent them. Ooh. So I was able to rent one for $60 for three months. I'm like, what? that actually... I know that I don't get anything at the end of the day, but it's a passing obsession for me, and I know how my brain works. And that might perfect. be what I need because yeah. I too have looked at racing wheels and been because I did the racing wheel thing actually on Xbox for like a Forza game, and was like, this is great. And then later I ended up selling the wheel to uh, help buy uh, the Switch for my father-in-law for Christmas. Oh, um, nice. But now with GT7, I'm like, I need a wheel again. I need a wheel again. But this renting a wheel thing sounds pretty sweet, actually. Like, yeah, it's the right fix for someone like me. We'll see. I don't uh, I won't shout out the website because I don't, I have no idea how this will go. Maybe this okay. is going to be a mistake. <laughs> I looked up stuff about this website, though, and everything seemed to be 
Okay. Like good reviews. Obviously, there's always people complaining about everything, but the price was right. But uh, GT7, insane in VR, like just a total new way to play the game. It changes uh, it I, completely. Yeah. Totally changes everything. And then I'm trying to think what else. Oh, Horizon Call of the Mountain is a game that actually the more I play it, the more I kind of don't like it in that okay. it's a lot of climbing. It's a climbing <laughs> game. If you like yes. if you like doing this or OK, for the audio listeners, if you like just like moving your hands around, climb and stuff, that's m- most of what this game is. There's some combat and some other stuff. But the more I play, I'm I'm finding myself to be a little bored with it but there's dude there's so many other stuff too that you have on the on our document here like tetris effect is amazing res infinite super cool there's just a lot of really good stuff yeah it's i just started village in vr uh the other morning uh, for chapter select my plan is to play it in vr i don't know if i'm going to stick with that because i learned yesterday i'm all kitted up at five in the morning because it's the only time the house is quiet enough for vr and then at, at 40 minutes in, I hear Eloise crying and needing the help or something. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, I can't pause, save, like pausing and tending to my daughter is far more cumbersome in VR than it is, you know, just pausing the game. So I may, I may switch to the VR version as just a casual more, I might mm-hmm. stream it like I did Resident Evil 4 or I might just play it for myself because holy cow, it is so immersive. It yeah. fe- loading the pistol and having to slide the rail back, the flashlight, the fact that you can hold it like this, uh, uh, you know, uh, downward, I guess, or hold it up. I like holding it up. I think that feels so mm-hmm. natural in that. Man, it's wild. It's also the first VR game that I feel comfortable with the the hip, like grabbing stuff that doesn't actually exist on your body. I'm more. I usually enjoy the whole weapon wheel and just picking that way. But this feels like when I reach for the pistol that I come back with the pistol. I don't gra- come back with empty air or anything like that. It feels pretty good. I'm surprised actually. And it makes me yeah. all the more excited for Resident Evil 4 in VR when they put that version out whenever that I'm is. so curious about that. Because they haven't said what it is. Exactly. And I think people forget that. I see a lot of articles that are like, Resident Evil 4 are going to be fully playable in VR. I'm like, Capcom has not said that. Yeah. Capcom needs to please say it so then I can be excited. But if it is that promise of the whole game in VR, I think that will... Because you and I, we talked about it on Sacred Symbols. Playing it in VR on the Quest was completely my favorite way to play it out of the three that I you know, did. So playing this remake, I think, would be transformative. Well, here's here's a, a thought about that, is that for Village, we have a first-person game that now is in VR, uh, mm-hmm. which makes sense. But they also, when they did the DLC, they made it third-person. Yes. Like, traditional. So they have some kind of expertise in making games that work in not only first-person, but also third-person, and also in VR, and yeah. so while Resident Evil 4 Remake is in third person, why wouldn't they make a first person version that's flat screen, but yeah. then also make the whole game in VR? I feel like if it wasn't the whole game, they need to say something soon. They need yes. to set the expectations because right now I, expectations from gamers are always through the roof. Yes. But the fact they're being a little quiet about it seems weird. Yes, they need to say I something agree. if it's not the full game. I totally agree. And with the game coming out in just like two weeks, I think, out of this recording. And I get that they just said this development on the VR version starts, which I kind of find hard to believe. I feel like yeah. they've been at least doing pre-production development on it. Like, I don't think they just started it. It feels a little weird that they're like, it started. I'm like, well, I feel like you've done at least something. But I've written, I wrote a post on Max Frequency about how I think the RE engine might be like the most flexible proprietary engine out there first person third person vr cross-platform support all the way down to the switch and cloud versions to pc and the high like the and then all the different types of games that they do with it street fighters in the re engine they're Mm -hmm. i think one of the more recent monster hunter games is in it or maybe the next one is going to be they've even done some of their retro collections in re engine i think the uh 
oh, what is the the game with the the knight that throws arrows and it's really really hard? Oh, oh uh, Ghosts and Goblins. Or Ghosts and Goblins. Ghosts that and like Ghosts and Ghouls, whatever. Yeah, that reimagined game they put out a year or so ago. That's an RE engine. So like the diversity of their tech is insane. Um, so I feel yeah. like they could put the whole game in VR. Well, in first person, but we'll see if they do that. The, yeah, absolutely. The eye tracking, I think, is the most transformative thing. It I've never experienced anything like this. Yeah, well, that's what I was saying on Sacred Symbols this past week, is that for Res Infinite, there's a mode where yes. you can you can aim with your eyes, and I was imagining telling my younger self, like, not only are you going to have good VR someday that's actually cool and fun, but you'll be able to control video games with your eyes. Like, it just, we're, it feels like we're living in the future, and... To be clear, like we, it feels like we're living in the future all the time. We've got these tiny little devices that let mm-hmm. us talk to literally anyone in the world. Not literally, but practically anybody in the world. And But yeah, VR, it's exciting. It, I, I love being an evangelist for VR because... And, and it can be frustrating sometimes because it's a, it's a medium and a way to play games that I really believe in. And I love showing people. I had a friend over last Sunday... And he never tried VR before, ever. Wow. And so I got to show him PlayStation VR, and it was just like, he was in the car in GT7. He's like, oh my God. Oh my God. Oh, like, he just, he couldn't, he was like, speechless. I, and just imagine, like, man, that's kind of awesome. Like, I remember my first experience with VR was with an Oculus dev kit that was for how to train your dragon, actually, that that weekend at New York Comic Con. Ah. And it was it was bad, but it was amazing at the time. Yeah. So I love I love preaching the gospel of VR, but it comes with some caveats. I hate that that it's like I want to s- tell people like yeah, go buy a PlayStation VR two. It's amazing. It really is. But I don't feel confident in Sony's support for it. I've seen them drop other stuff before. We don't have a roadmap of what to expect. We have some games we know coming, like the that Switchback game is coming in a few weeks and stuff like that, yeah. but. I don't know what their first party support looks like. And right now, dude, things are up in the air with Meta, who I think that while people love to hate on Meta for many reasons that they deserve, they're part of the reason why VR is still around and still doing pretty well. They're the ones that dumped all the investment money into making the quest happen, which is an essential device for the health of VR. So it really is. It's tough. But yeah. either way, I, I love it for what it is. I don't know if it's it's worth the investment for a lot of people, but I'm I'm absolutely loving it. Yeah, it's great. I The showcase, if they had a showcase this summer, which I think they would, we need to see first party Sony and some second party exclusive like prep ordeals coming in. Uh, I in my bones, I believe Insomniac is working on a VR game because they have experience doing it back before they were acquired by Sony. They had some VR stuff. I think they've done HoloLens games as well. Like they, that studio has experience and just the fact, I just can't imagine them not tapping into one of their most successful developers to make a VR title exclusive for their platform. So like in my bones, I believe Insomniac is working on something, which is hard when you look at everything else they're making, it's hard to really imagine because spider-man 2 wolverine who knows what else i think my dream would be a resistance game revive resistance as a vr type game for psvr 2 i think would be cool or they could do a new thing i don't know but that's my hope i think hitman 3 could make the jump too if you because it's on psvr 1 it's the console exclusive version of it but they have it on pc so there's a version of hitman 3 that has you know that type of hand tracking and inward out tracking and things like that. I'm not saying it's an easy port over, but I do think it could give Hitman VR like a real boost to life, at least in the console version. Cause I, I want to play it, but the idea of hooking PSVR one up when that came out was just not appealing. It's not very good on PSVR one either Mm. because they don't, they didn't have the proper, controllers to really yeah. make it work i think it's all with a dual shock and it's it's just not where it needed to be here's hopeful. my my take on what they need to do or what would be a smart decision is that 
when VR first came out, it was clear, you know, people were putting like Half-Life in VR, putting Minecraft in VR, stuff that, and they were doing it in really basic ways that was like instantly making people sick, like mm-hmm. immediately. And it was like weird and janky and you're like either pointing with your head or you're pointing with a, a mouse or a controller. It just wasn't quite right. And so I think we got this mindset that VR games needed to be made from the ground up for VR which I mm-hmm. think is somewhat true to have the best VR experience. But I think that times have changed and we've seen conversions that are awesome. Particularly, we just talked about Resident Evil Village is an amazing conversion that really shows that it's like, hey, you can have an awesome AAA game and convert it to VR. And while there are going to be some compromises in terms of like how the cutscenes work and stuff like that, people are okay with that. Even I think on on the first PlayStation VR, Skyrim VR, I think is amazing. I think that game is underappreciated for how cool it was. And and sure, it had lots of problems. Um, it had issues where you could like with the motion controls, you basically just had to like tickle people with a sword in order to <laughs> to hurt them. But it it showed that we can take existing games and turn them to VR games and have them be transformative. And that's why I posted a tweet a few weeks ago. It's like please. Give us Bioshock VR. Yeah. It could work. It would absolutely work with a gun in one hand and your plasma in another, your plasmids in another hand. It would be so cool. So I just hope that Sony is looking at that and like, man, we can, we don't need to necessarily just invest in brand new VR games. We can, we can put some money up to, to convert some games. Yeah. Uh, and as long as they're done right, maybe they have Capcom help out. I don't, I don't know. But, as long as it's done right. And GT7 is a game that's technically converted to be a mm-hmm. VR game. There's a lot of potential there that I just, I really hope they tap into. And look at Meta. They helped bring Resident Evil 4, the original game, to VR. And that transforms mm-hmm. that title. And I don't. I feel like I'm one of the few people that remember San Andreas is supposed to be coming to the quest. Mm-hmm. that's going to be a big deal. I would actually love it if it also came to PSVR 2 because just visually and being able to lose yourself in San Andreas without worrying about the battery per se would be yeah. great. But taking, it's actually, oh my gosh, I'm blinking on his name. Jason Rubin, who Naughty Dog co-founder running things on the game side over at Meta now, he has talked about in the past about taking this GameCube PS2 era and bringing it into VR because graphically it's kind of where at least the quest is at, but those games are already designed and it's just adapting it to VR. And I'm not saying that's an easy task, but it could be done. And I've seen like the metal gear solid one VR version on PC that fans are putting together. Could you, first of all, Konami would actually have to care, I suppose, (laughs) but could you just imagine taking the visual fidelity doesn't matter so much. It's just the experience. And I think losing yourself in on Shadow Moses would be phenomenal and would feel right at home on PlayStation. Right. And I think that one of the understated things about PSVR 2 right now, I, I mentioned about how people are forgetting what PSVR 1 was like, is that PSVR 1 was it was it was known that when you bought and played that headset that you were going to get a significant downgrade in the graphics for vr games because the ps4 the ps4 was not designed to do vr and it's not wasn't quite it was like just there in terms of power and now with playstation 5 yeah it's not parody the game doesn't look as good in vr there are cutbacks but the the gap is so much shorter now so much shorter and it uh it, it makes a huge difference and i think that like dude even just looking at a game like gt7 you can look at them the a flat screen version of the vr and the regular version yeah you're going to see that the regular version is better but that difference is so much smaller um and so yeah bringing up back those some of these old games converting them to vr definitely i i would love all of that yeah it would be great so very hopeful for this summer kind of a better vision for the next year of psvr2 and Hopefully, Sony comes in with some positive encouragement and, yeah. you know, reward. And not reward, because we still have to pay for these games and stuff. But, you know, these early adapters, this first six months, these people, you know, here's what you have to look forward to with your headset. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful for that. 
My my one big beef though, biggest beef so far, there is no physical version of Horizon Call of the Mountain. Mm. I did not get the Horizon bundle because I was like, I'll buy the physical version. And then Sony's like, nah, it's a digital only, boys. And that just brings me to the thing I think you and I both we both care about a lot. Physical games, collecting games. I you've you've done collection videos. You actually inspired me to make one on my channel, which was really fun to make, just show off the whole collection and things like that. But how I how are you feeling about the the retro game scene lately? Feels like COVID it spiked. We talked about that I think back in November before we recorded the show, but what are you feeling like these days, this early 2023 hmm. market? So before I, I answer that, I got to break your heart a little bit. Mm. I have decided that I am going digital for VR games mm. because I cannot stand the hassle of switching games while I have a headset on. And That's the thing with VR is that I like to change it up. I was trying to do physical for PSVR one. I was like, ah, oh, this, I, <laughs> I hate doing this. Like it, some people have that barrier just for normal games. I'm totally fine getting up and switching a disc. But when I've got a pound of stuff on my head between <laughs> headphones and I'm like locked in with the, the controllers and stuff, it's just like, you know what? And, and Sony obviously hasn't made that easier. Like you said, the Call of the Mountain isn't, isn't physical. So it's like, you know what? I'm just going to get stuff digital for for vr specifically but other than that i still very much am all about physical stuff and and you bring up the the retro market and i've kind of been out of the scene for a few months mainly just that i was spending so much money really uh before like in the fall specifically when i was really into it and spending a lot of money which it was like i was happy to spend that money because i was really into the hobby but as we got closer to Christmas, I thought, you know what? I'm going to back off for a little bit mm -hmm. just because I can kind of focus that money. I'm spending money on other, you know, spending money for Christmas presents and stuff like that. Yeah. So I have backed off. But it's funny you bring this up just because I just bought a copy of Symphony of the Night for PS1, like a black box copy from someone in the Last Stand Discord. And that gave oh. me a little taste that I'm like, hmm. Mm -hmm. maybe it is maybe it's time to come back uh now that you know the the holidays are over it's i mean i live in western pennsylvania so who knows when it's going to be warm again but it will be time <laughs> to start going out and hunting some garage sales and stuff like that so i'm definitely feeling the itch and it feels like a good time to to come back in that the prices definitely were really pretty bad but I think that we are definitely starting to see some of that come down. We're never going to go back to old prices. Like it's just yeah. not never happening, you know? And it, it's weird because the, the price rise, there are multiple factors. There's COVID people getting stimulus money. Prices go up from that. There's the whole grading fiasco where that inflated the price of games. And then just in addition, I think one of the understated ones is that, there are stupid YouTubers like me or whatever that go and show how cool this hobby is and how much they enjoy it. And that spikes demand. Like, dude, if Scott the Waz makes a video on GameCube games, the price goes up. Like, for sure, millions of people are going to see that video and think, oh, I'd like to get some GameCube games too. Well, there's only so many of them out there now, and they're not making more of them. So it's, you know, it's all these factors at once. But like I said, I think it is starting to go down i'm noticing that some of the games that i i bought for a pretty high price are starting to go down which i think makes sense with you know we're we're in a recession right now it doesn't seem like it's going to get better for a little yeah. while and so people are are cutting back on these things which is good if you're still in the market for for collecting yeah it i was i had a, a, about 20 minutes between a trip from home to my aunt and uncle's last night and i stopped at a game store and i was like this doesn't seem as bad as it was a while ago i did mm -hmm. i've i've bought a couple of things lately that kind of just finally bit the bullet on like spirit tracks zelda for the ds okay. i've always wanted that and that one's just been one that's just crept for years and has gotten out of hand but it was in really good condition complete in box so it's like all right i'm pulling the trigger on this just getting it done and out of the way i feel like that one's never gonna come down and and last year was a big pokemon hunt 
again, that was probably one of the worst times probably to buy Pokemon games, but I feel like those prices never, never, ever come down either. So finally just biting the bullet, cleaning things up. I once had a copy of Symphony of the Night. It wasn't complete in box. It was just mm. kind of in a case. F- won it on eBay for $35. And then I get the game and it doesn't work. Like it's not loading all the way. And the dummy I am, I returned it. I should have kept it and take it to like a local mom and pop and had them do like a disc polish on it. Because at 35 right. bucks, what am I losing? $35, I guess. But that's nothing compared to the prices these days for it. So that's one I've always regretted. Like yeah, getting... you could sell the case for for more than thirty five dollars. <laughs> well, I don't know quite about that. I'm trying to think. Uh, box only. Uh, let's just you know, a little live on the fly. Simply, price charting, this, dude. Yeah, dude. I love price charting is such a great resource, and I love just learning more about this market. So, Symphony of the Night box only. Recent comps look like. Forty dollars, forty five dollars. <laughs> so that's you know, no game. You're still looking at at that kind of price for the black box. So yeah, man, it's I was, that's one of the dumbest things I've done in a while for retro collecting. But you know, then there on the other hand, I have like two copies of Twilight Princess for the GameCube, I'm just sitting on those. Dude. You know, so it's like sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Hey, but let I'm, me if you ever if you ever want to unload one of those two copies, let me know. Or if you want to trade, I've got some other stuff. One of them is disc only. That one, so uh, you would have to be cool with that. So it no, was, yeah, absolutely it, not. Exactly. <laughs> Most people. That's aren't. the thing. Yeah, you gotta. Some I people do. More power to you. Yeah, you definitely want the box. But no, we've all made those mistakes, though, dude. I had a copy of the Misadventures of Tron Bon for PS One, which is one of the rarest PS One games. <laughs> it's like, uh, uh, let's see, Tron <laughs> Bon. By the way, that's a um. That's a Mega Man Legends spin-off game. The complete price for that is five hundred and ninety one dollars. Oh, and I sucks. sold it. I wanna say I sold it for two hundred. And I thought I was getting out like crazy back then. Oh, and now man. I wish I had it because I played that game growing up. I love that game. Yeah. But it was at a time when I wasn't making as much and I wanted to buy something. I was like, Well, these are my assets and I don't want this right now. So I sold it. And it's like, damn. That was I mean, that's been me a lot of times. I sold my basically my entire ps3 collection to get mm. an xbox one because at the time i wanted both generations and was yeah, of the next thing and i couldn't swing it and so i sold a bunch of that and when they announced the store was shutting down that kind of sent me on my ps3 re-splurge of the collection to like kind of get it back up to where it should be and i'm not there yet but I'm closer, but I regret that. My Wii U, I had the Wind Waker Wii U. I had to trade that for a Switch. Now, I did eventually luck out, and I got another Wind Waker Wii U at a GameStop here. They had, like, Wii U's on sale for, like, 80 bucks. And if you bought a console, you got, like, buy to get half off on games and stuff. And so there was a Wind Waker Wii U, like, 20 miles away at a GameStop. And so I snatched that sucker up. And got Breath of the Wild and Wind Waker and Twilight Princess before those prices shot up as well. But giving that original Wii U away, I lost all of my WiiWare virtual console games that I transferred oh, over. Yeah. All the save datas. So that's all gone, unfortunately. So that was that was one thing that, you know, regrets. We all we all have regrets. But the Wii U and 3DS stores are shutting down very soon. And so we're not going to have officially ways to purchase a lot of these games. They're going away. Like I said earlier, the PS3 store and Vita store were almost shut down. Thank goodness they weren't, at least as of this time. I'm kind of getting... This digital future has me concerned because there's backward compatibility is feeling rarer. People are concerned now about the Switch. Jumping from a new chip, that could be an issue. Sony, of course, very limited backward compatibility, only if you pay the highest tier of their subscription for interesting emulation there. And then Xbox ended their back compat program. Like, I feel like times are a change in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's definitely frustrating. This Nintendo situation with Wii U and 3DS is, is tough. I was actually thinking, like, should I try to go and 
and buy some of these games. But then I was thinking, you can't, don't you have to do it a weird way with like gift cards? You have to load money onto your account. So yeah, because they shut down using a credit card on the consoles uh, last year, I think, or a few months ago. It, either I think it was last year. So the only way to get money onto those eShops is to buy a Nintendo gift card now, put it on your Switch, and then your My Nintendo account is synced across, so then that has the mm. 50 100 $200. So you kind of have to go through the Switch to then go onto those consoles. So it's it's cumbersome. It's doable, but it, it is a process. Yeah. Well, that's one of those things that's just like when they shut it down, do you really blame people for hacking their Wii U or 3DS in order to just simply get access to some of these games? Because it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, we could do the legal route and go and find a physical co- – like, and I'm saying once the store is closed. Like, you could go and find a copy of whatever, Fire Emblem Awakening, in order to, to play it fully – legally but it's like nintendo doesn't get any of that money yeah it just goes to the the person that you know you're buying it from and i'm not trying to just i'm not obviously it's a a huge morally gray area and it's obviously a more cut and dry legal area obviously as someone who who works in the games industry to some extent i i believe in in paying for these products and and supporting developers and keeping the the industry healthy but at the same time, I, I'm a huge proponent of keeping these games around from a historical perspective. That's like essential. And I, I know there are arguments of people that are like, well, it's not up to you to decide just because you want to play it doesn't give you the right to go and steal it. They might not want you to have the right to play it at all, or mm-hmm. they might want to make it difficult. I'm like, I, I kind of get that, but I also don't care. <laughs> I just like simply at the end of the day, I don't care. I will buy a game. If I want to play it and it's available for me to buy, I will do so. Right. But if it's not available and the price is astronomical, I really don't feel guilty downloading it. I don't. I'm in the same boat. I, I, great example. Metal Gear Solid 3D. Or Metal Gear Solid 3 in general. Oh. But 3D on the 3DS. Always wanted that game. But never snagged it when it was like $20, $15. Then they announced the eShop. Or actually it was Konami delisting Metal Gear Solid 2 and 3 digitally for legal copyright issues they had to like renew licenses of footage i actually don't think those games are available digitally still to this day yeah which is a shame because they are two of the greatest games of all time but that removed it from the digital store on the 3ds spiking the price the news that the stores are shutting down spiked the price there's a copy that has been sitting at a local mom and pop i think originally i saw it i think in the 300s it's now down to like 180 but again, I'm not going to pay, I love Metal Gear Solid 3, but I'm not going to pay $180 to try it. On, I'm not going to play the whole game on 3DS, but I've always been curious, right? Sure. And so it's this, mm-hmm. there's no way for me to buy it, uh, to support Konami directly. Not that Konami cares about my support, I guess, all in all, or Metal Gear. But I want to pay for these things and the developers and support these games, you know, it, they, it, they deserve it. They put a lot of hard work into them. But when every when these companies take away the means to support them, it's where do where does that leave us? It's such a messy situation all in all. And there's some there's some games that are going to be lost. Look at, I think, Earthbound Beginnings, the English oh, translation yeah. of the first mother game for the NES only available on the Wii U as of this recording, I believe. I don't think it's on the Switch Virtual Console yet. So, you know, that's gone. The Metroid yeah. Prime Trilogy, that once again will enter the hollowed halls of not being accessible because that digital store shuts down. It's a Mega Man Battle Network up until the collection is released in April, which I understand is a small gap. But if that collection wasn't announced, that buying those games is not feasible anymore it's just all this stuff digital they can just take copies away from games away from consumers at any time whether it's a legal reason like metal gear or they just don't want you to play it anymore which is a strange thing to think about to me the the thing is is just that i don't i'm not one of those people that think that we need to have every nintendo game ever made playable (laughs) on the switch i understand that's not I don't want that either. And I also understand, too, that it's 
there there eventually hits a business decision about keeping these payment systems and these storefronts open that they can't be open Mm -hmm. indefinitely forever at least from their perspective but i'm almost like is it how much is it really costing you you took out the the payment element of it it's like just keep it up into some extent because eventually you're gonna like you won't be able to buy stuff soon on on these platforms but at some point down the line they're going to turn off downloads too like they yep. did for the Wii where you're not going to be able to go and re-download that stuff so i don't know it's it's a a tough situation but i am glad to see there is some effort being done now from i mean from from Nintendo and Sony both right now the the Game Boy Advance online stuff has been awesome on the Switch and i love seeing that kind of stuff even if it is a bit selective at least it's some options right yeah and then playstation with their their classics while they've been a very very slow drip feed the fact that those are available they are in their it's a good quality it's a good play experience and that oh mostly they are offering you to buy them a la carte is great so I'm, i'm glad at least something is being done but obviously i think it could be better yeah, it definitely it definitely could. It bums it bums me out and just makes me want to buy more things to fill my shelves, which then fills mm-hmm. my home and office and then my wife gets more and more concerned about our space. Mm, yeah, <laughs> I understand that. Very limited these days. Ugh, but I think that does it, Dustin, for our time mm. today. So thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Where can the people find you online at, on Twitter at Dustin can fly last damn media, right. all that stuff, right? Yeah. So as you said, twitter.com slash Dustin can fly is where I'm tweeting and talking about stuff. I, I keep my Twitter stuff pretty positive. I don't get in fights or, well, I am controversial only in my opinions, but not that's, and it's about dumb stuff like don't video engage. games and anime. So, uh, you can find me there, of course, Last Stand Media, patreon.com slash Last Stand Media. We're on YouTube. Sacred Symbols is our main thing, but we also have an Xbox show. We have a new show that's a conversational show called Constellation that we've really been excited about. So, yeah, Last Stand and my Twitter, and that's about it. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for listening. You can find me over at maxfrequency.net where I write and where all these shows go. You can Check out my other podcast, Chapter Select, a seasonal show where we bounce back and forth between a series exploring their evolution, design, and legacy. Right now, Season 5 Resident Evil is going on. Dustin was on that show, Resident Evil 4 episode, mid-season. So that's out now, right before the release of the remake, which is going to be... The demo's up, and I'm very tempted. I want to play the demo, I think. Don't play it. Don't do it. (sighs) But I kind of Just wait. It's not that far. Don't spoil it. You'll be glad that that day you'll be like, you know, you're kind of right. Because I watched some of Game Informer's coverage and I saw like a new design for a monster. and I was like, dang it. Why did I look at this? Yeah, man. So maybe not. I don't know. I just know that I'm not going to be playing it at launch because we're playing through the games right now. And just schedule wise, I have to I just beat Code Veronica. Great game. Mm. We'll talk obviously about that on the episode. But now I'm in Village and then it's five and six and we're capping the season with the remake and just my schedule and ability to play games i gotta kind of play them in that order i can't drop right. it all for a remake so it's further away for me so i'm tempted there's that taste but sure that might make it worse you never you're playing with fire here <laughs> exactly i'm <laughs> flirting with danger but you can all go check that out and then i am on twitter at max roberts 143 but i uh i've pulled a colin as it were i just tweet when stuff goes up so really maxfrequency.net is where you want to go. But until next time, thank you all so much, and adios. See ya. Thanks. Okay, I'm recording. Beautiful. That's a beautiful thing. I'm going to clear the trash, pull you up, take one more sip of my coffee, and we'll get going. Dude, I'm I'm out of coffee. Well, you're out of coffee at home, and I had to run to Duncan because that's the closest coffee place and now I'm out of it. I don't really need more coffee than this though. I don't I I don't need to die. I think the last time I had Duncan was PAX. Oh East. yeah, cuz they're everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. PAX East 20 Yeah. I guess it was 19 cuz 2020 was the COVID year, right? Right. Yeah, so yeah. 19 is when I went to my one and only PAX. And mm. there was a I was there that year. 
we may have walked by each other, mm-hmm. not even know. Yeah. But I was, uh, we were at an Airbnb and there was a Dunkin' literally around the block. So every morning, breakfast and coffee there. And I got like a mega Hell tall yeah. black coffee and that's what fueled me for PAX. Nice. I, so in my research of you, I found out that you're, well, I guess I had known because you've said it, I think just passing in the past, but you're a pretty big coffee guy in general, like roasting beans oh. and grinding and all that stuff. Yes, there are limits. Like I've I've tried roasting my own beans, but it's very I found it to be very tough with kind of using basic stuff. Like I was using like you can get this like twisty popcorn thing that you can kind of roast beans on a on a uh, stove. I was never very good at it, but I very much am into the like small batch Going gotcha. to like figure like wherever like specific places that they're roasted, doing pour over with you know grinding your own beans, all that. Yeah, super into that. Okay, so I I like coffee, like I think most people. Um, but we did, sat down and did our our budget, and my coffee subscription needed to be cut because I was doing Cometeer. You ever heard of them? They do those oh, frozen yeah, yeah, pots. Yeah. It's oh, actually, yeah, those are actually really good. Those are delicious. shockingly good. I've had it for like yeah. a year and a half now. But it's like I get one box a month, and that's mm-hmm. a one cup of coffee a day. And it's like 70-something bucks a box. And then yeah. between our just normal Starbucks, mostly my wife, but, I mean, I also get it a lot. We were spending like 150 bucks on coffee a month. I was like, I, I can't do that with the kid. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, if you – dude, here's the thing about commentary. If you like that, then – if you just make one investment into your coffee setup, you can brew coffee as good as Cometeer at home very easily. It's just yes. not – it's not as convenient as just pouring hot water in. We, yes. Cometeer sponsored us. Oh, so they did? I, and I was really – yeah. A, a, like Maybe this time last year or something like that. They sponsored us. And I was pumped because I was interested but also kind of skeptical. And I loved the convenience factor that's like, oh, I got to record in 10 minutes. Let's just – all you got to do is pour hot water and it's very good. It's like, it's just as good as pour over. It's just the price per cup. That was my thing. I wanted consistency because before Mm -hmm. basically pan, I, my coffee, I guess addiction started at the office and that was just a cure egg, but it was free and Mm -hmm. I could have like three cups. Then we work from home. Suddenly coffee costs me money. I can't afford three cups of coffee a day. And then, so I've got like a French press and then that was, my quality jumped. And then I was like, well, I can't. The French press, I just wasn't finding a groove with it. A lot of grains, you know. I don't like French press. No. I respect it, but I've never, I've never, I don't, I like it to be clean. Yes. I don't know. I don't want particles in it. So that was what led me to comment here for consistency and convenience. So then, anyway, all that to say, yeah. I've been, I was getting ready to switch and like look into pour over and stuff. And funny enough, Logan and my other buddies in like my daily discord with them, I guess last year, I don't know if you've heard of this thing, the X bloom, this pour over coffee machine. I'll send you, there's the link. Oh, it's a, oh, it's an automatic one. I've heard of things like this. It's got a grinder in it and it uses like, I don't know, electrodes or something to like spin the water around. Anyway, they backed the Kickstarter for me last year as a baby gift slash Christmas Uh... gift. And so I'm asking my buddy Grant, who is huge into coffee, has a whole, like, his spare bedroom in his apartment is a coffee lab, like, way into it. Nice. So I was, like, bugging him. I'm like, hey, man, can you help me, like, figure out what I need to just, like, learn to do a pour over? And he's like, I'll get back to you. And he was pushing me off till this thing was showing up. So it just showed up. I actually made my first cup with it today. It's pretty funky. There's a lot going on in it. And I have a lot to learn. Yeah, this thing looks funky. It looks cool. I'm not sure. I mean, the fact you got it for as a gift is the ultimate way to get it because I don't yes. know. And the Kickstarter was also half off. So $800, oh, oh they paid $400 and they yeah. all chipped in. So really it was, I don't know exactly how they split it, but yeah, I'm not, I did not buy this for myself. This was a gift. I was happy to right. buy like a hand grinder in a kettle and learn that way. But this thing... I'm pretty excited about it because now I'm going to learn. This is something. I'm, I've am i never heard of this. This thing's crazy. I'm going to have to see. There's a YouTuber I really like, a coffee YouTuber named James Hoffman. Yes. that's. I'm waiting for him, him to put a video up on this. Yeah. I'm, oh, this is weird enough that I'm sure that he'll do something. He has to. 
Yeah. Um, so we'll just see when he gets it. But I want him to. So I've been watching his videos to like learn just pour over stuff to then apply them. Anyway, I've yeah. been very excited about it. I don't, the coffee tangent. I, oh, you're Duncan. That's how it all started. Yeah, Duncan is good basic coffee. Obviously, I like fancy stuff, but I was in a pinch. So yeah, sometimes morning, so. you're in a pinch. And now I'm out of coffee. Mm-hmm. Damn. So to water we go. All right, now we can get started for real. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs>